database. Here's, here's the problem with putting names in the database. In 2010, the last year that the ATF gave us this information, we know that there were 76,000 denials of instant background check purchases. Um, only 48 of those denials were referred for prosecution to federal court. 28 were prosecuted and 13 resulted in convictions. So of the 76,000 denials, there were only 13 federal convictions. So from that, I have to believe that most of those denials were false positives or, or some problem with the system. If we put more names into the system, what you will get are far more false positives. And the problem is the NICS uh, background check hasn't stopped a school shooting or a mass public shooting. And that's what a lot of people uh, are using as the motivation for introducing this language into the omnibus. The second thing I want to say is that this Nix, uh, fixed Nix bill was attached. It passed the House once before when it was inserted in another bill that was for reciprocity that would allow national concealed carry reciprocity. Uh, there was a promise that was made to a lot of members that the fixed Nix language would not come back to the floor unless it was an integral part, unless it included the reciprocity language. Because at the time, I warned my colleagues that uh, this fixed Nix language was going to come back without reciprocity and uh, that they should not allow it. At the time, we tried to avoid the rule. Some of us voted against the rule that connected That's right. That's right. fixed Nix and reciprocity because we were worried about this very thing. Uh, so 40 members of Congress in the majority signed a letter saying they would not vote for fixed NICs if it came back without the reciprocity language. So what I'm trying to do here really is make it more likely in, in an odd way that the omnibus will pass because 40 people, 40 members of the majority have already said this is a poison pill. And they put that in a writing, in, in writing, in a letter to the speaker and the other leadership. Uh, just if, if I may have some more time, I want to go through the history here of fixed NICs in the House, the recent history. 2007, there was a bill that was passed. It was called the NICs Improvement Amendments Act. Passed the House and the Senate by voice vote, so nobody went on record on this. Later on, th that bill became a rule in the uh, previous administration, the Obama administration, at the Social Security Administration that said if you have a representative payee, uh, that you were going to lose your right to own a firearm. Not only would you be put into the next database, but you also can't legally own ammunition or a firearm at that point. So that, and in fact, the bill or the rule that the Obama administration came up with was called Implementation of the Next Improvement Amendments Act of 2007. When uh, the presidency changed, and we stayed in the majority in the House and the Senate, we, we promptly um, offered a bill th using the Congressional Review Act. And what this bill did is it repealed that rule. It turned back that rule. And what it did is it uh, said that Congress disapproves the rule submitted by the Social Security Administration relating to the implementation of the Nix Improvement Amendments Act of 2007. So here you have the Nix Am Am Improvement Amendments Act of 2007 pass. You have the Obama administration use that at the Social Security Administration, and I would say also at the VA. I want to get to that later. And then Congress comes in and reverses that ruling by effectively repealing the implementation of the 2007 Act. But tonight, here we get from the WIP, the WIP team, they say that this Fix Nix Act reauthorizes the Nix Improvement Act. So we got a little bit of schizophrenia going on here, or a little flip-flopping. Uh, among the majority, we, you know, we remanded a rule and now uh, that was caused or enabled by the 2007 Nix Improvement Act. And now we're going and we're reauthorizing that bill that enabled that rule. So just a little bit of history there. One other piece of history I want to mention. We have not changed any of the policies at the VA. At the VA, you have veterans who are losing the right to keep and bear arms every day through paperwork. It does not go through a judicial system. It's purely administrative. Uh, if, they, if they do so much as just to say, 
to the person interviewing them, somebody else manages my finances. Then they can administratively lose their right to own a firearm without going through a judge. That, I want to be clear, that is happening now. That's happened in the past few years. The Nix, the Fix Nix bill will make that worse because it will apply more pressure to the Veterans Administration to more diligently report those veterans' names into the database. And I've had employees at the VA, two employees who've called me confidentially and shared paperwork, casework with me, showing how a veteran loses their rights without a judge being involved. This troubles me greatly. It troubled our whole Congress because uh, last year we passed a bill, H.R. 1181, called the Veterans uh, Second Amendment Protection Act, which would have fixed that problem at the VA, that lack of due process. A lot of members went to the floor and debated in favor of that. Nearly every member of the majority voted for it. Some members of the minority voted for that to fix this problem at the VA. And it didn't pass in the Senate because it wasn't eligible for the Congressional Review Act required 60 votes. I suppose they didn't think they had 60 votes there. So this problem still exists at the VA. Every member of the majority knows it. And the fix Nix uh, bill language that's in the omnibus is going to exacerbate that problem. It will result in more veterans losing their right to keep and bear arms. And I just want to close by saying you can go back and look at all the cases. There's not a, uh, a school shooting that would have been prevented by implementing this Fix Nix Act. The, the ball that was dropped in Florida was at the FBI. And that particular uh, lack of diligence, I would say, is not addressed by the Fix Nix Act. Now, some might say the shooting in Florida at the church could have been prevented if the military had submitted those names more diligently. But here's the thing. If you really wanted to, to do this properly, instead of telling the every branch of the administration, every agency, like the VA, for instance, that you've got to submit names, you should just go to the courts and say that because the courts are really the only place, whether it's a state court, federal court, or a military court, where you should ever be stripped of your right, to of any right, frankly, and, and especially the right to keep and bear arms for a veteran who has taken up arms to defend our Constitution. And with that, um, I want to yield to my co-sponsor here, Mr. Jim Jordan from Ohio. Well, I, I want to thank the chairman of the Second Amendment Caucus for that thorough um, explanation. I would just say, look, this is a violation of due process rights uh, when it comes to American citizens. Um, Bureaucrats would be in, have the ability to take away their fundamental Second Amendment liberties and not a court of law. And second, I would just point out this is a fundamental violation of what our leadership told us they were going to do. When we passed the legislation that, that had the Nix issue and the reciprocity issue married together on the House floor via the rule, we were assured by our leadership this bill would not come back by itself, would not be placed on the must-pass legislation. Uh, without the reciprocity language, obviously that's not the case with, with the language that's in the current omnibus. And for those reasons, I support the gentleman's amendment. So just to summarize, the amendment strikes 16 pages from the omnibus. It strikes the entire, entire fixed Nix uh, language portion that's in the omnibus bill. And that would be 16 pages less you'd have to read tonight of 2,232 pages. Thank you very much, Mr. Weber. Chairman, with your indulgence, I'd like to be on the second panel. The gentleman will be on the second panel. The gentleman, Mr. Perry. Distinguished gentlemen, Mr. Perry, thank you for your service to our nation as a member of the United States Armed Forces, including, I believe, the United States Army, and your distinguished service on behalf of not only the Army, but the young men and women that you led. I want to thank you again for your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for this opportunity. I'm here as a, uh, a sympathetic voice to the uh, to the amendment that Mr. Massey, my friend from Kentucky, has offered. I lament that I was not listed as a co-sponsor, but I'm hoping that my presence here today will indicate my strong support. And, and, and for all the reasons that Mr. Massey and Mr. Jordan have already stated, uh, I would also include, for me, it's a due process issue. You don't take somebody's constitutional rights. I don't care which right it is away without due process. This, this uh, measure that's being added in the omnibus allows that to continue. It's happening now. It allows it to continue. And even worse, it codifies it in law. And I would say that every single one of us here, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, anyone in between, people that aren't, aren't uh, elected officials, people that are just serving, everybody walking the country 
wants this gun violence to end. And if you really want to do something to the next program, fix it so that the, it's more than just a name and a town location that goes in where they check that that they check your name in their town location. If there's a criminal in your town that has a similar name, you're going to show up, which is the 70-some thousand false positives that Mr. Massey talked about. If they would just use your Social Security number, that would be your positive identification, and that would prove who you are and whether you are eligible to buy a firearm or not. This is, this is not going to solve the problem that we have in our country. We're all going to walk away. Some of us are going to feel better about it, and some of us are going to know better that we haven't done a thing to make our country safer. At the same time, many of us are going to know that while we haven't made our country safer, we have abridged the rights of our fellow citizens. And most egregiously, as Mr. Massey has already informed you, those who have taken up arms in defense of the ideal, the ideas of America and our rights. And that, to me, is just something that, that I think that, that cooler heads and clear heads should prevail on. And, and not have this schizophrenia back and forth in the heat of the moment and be measured and do the right thing here uh, and strip that language out of this bill and, and take up that language at some other time where we can debate it fully and, and, and get to a solution that actually, actually makes a difference to keep our kids and our society safe. And with that, I yield the balance. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Mr. Biggs, welcome to the Wilson Greenwood Live that you show the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, an honor to be in, in front of this committee again. The last time was on the day after I got sworn in, and uh, I had to withdraw all of my amendments. But I'm, it, it, this time I'm hoping for better luck. Um, and I'm reminded of something a former Arizona uh, Congressman Mo Udall said. He used to say, everything's been said, it just hasn't been said by everyone yet. So with that, uh, I'm going to uh, yield back at this time. Just to, it, before I, I shouldn't say that because I'm going to say that I am strongly supportive of Mr. Masty's amendment. I think it's he's done an excellent job of explicating why. And so with that, I yield. Thank you very much.